the government. And actually what we did in Cameroon, we finished up the web feasibility and then we convened a high level a number, a sequence of high level meetings with the ministry to say, before you take any decision on a concession, these are the technical steps to do a proper land use planning process, including consultations with the communities. You have to do this, and then you decide what is the best area for palm oil expansion, what's the best area for conservation, what's the best area for tourism, what's the best area for, for water towers. But at the end, of course, yeah, it's the government deciding. In 2009, one of our partners, Conservation International, uh, released a report that indicated that 81% of the world's major uh, armed conflicts occur within the 34 most uh, biologically diverse areas in the world. Um, and those conflicts have occurred since the 1950s and seemingly could only be getting worse if possible. So it's very important that we understand the foundations and what, what is causing these resource-rich uh, areas, um, especially in terms of, you know, from our perspective, great ape habitat, uh, to be under severe conflict um, and, and often protracted conflict. The report also found that the loss of natural great ape ranges in Africa and Asia helps drive the illegal trade as it permits contact and conflict between apes and humans. We've done as human beings is take away everything that that elephant or those elephants or these chimpanzees or gorillas need to survive. They're in a full panic mode and they're trying to survive and you become, that's where human wildlife conflict comes into play. It's not that the elephant changed, it didn't become any different, it's not a rogue now because something in its chemistry or DNA suddenly changed, it has nowhere to go and it wants to reclaim some kind of land to live on. It's the same issue we have with chimpanzees and human beings in Uganda. We have it with countless other places where great apes and human beings, the rub is too close now. But I would ask as journalists that you dig a little deeper and not fall back on the easy explanation of it's gone rogue, it's gone crazy, um, it's a menace, it's a man-eater, it's a man-killer. It doesn't work that way. There's nothing at all in the DNA of a chimpanzee or gorilla that makes them want to fight with a human being. In fact, they would do everything they could to avoid coming into contact with human beings. But we take away their natural habitat and push further and further into their areas of safety, and eventually that conflict is going to come. And when I talked before about the number of great apes that are legally traded, one of the biggest issues is if you see a chimpanzee, a live chimpanzee being illegally traded or being sold or smuggled, that chimpanzee probably represents at least 10 that were killed in the forest to get that one. You cannot walk into a forest and pick up a baby chimpanzee. It doesn't happen that way. And chimpanzees live in large social groups and they fight back. They do not want to be um, threatened. So quite often that, that simple baby represents 10 dead ones to get a baby into the illegal trade chain. And there are numbers that vary for orangutans and bonobos and gorillas, but it can be that large. So when somebody is counting up ivory tusks for instance, and you see there's an ivory bust in Kuala Lumpur and there's a hundred tufts. All you need to do is divide by two and you say, okay, 50 elephants died. And that's sad. When you look at a chimpanzee, you need to say right away, I'm looking at 10 dead chimpanzees for that one. Great ape habitat is being lost at the rate of 2 to 5 percent annually. By 2030, less than 10 percent of the current range will remain on current trends. Finding that Asia is really a test case for the, the patterns being played out in Africa regarding palm oil and the growth of oil palm plantations and all the same devastation and biological uh, uh, destruction and the loss of biodiversity that is occurring in Asia is hitting us now in Africa as well. We have to learn from these lessons. 80% of Asia's tropical rainforests were wiped out to convert into palm oil plantations and we're seeing an even faster deforestation right now in Africa as this boom uh, grows. The Cross River Gorilla with fewer than 300 individuals estimated to exist in the wild and just a single identified member in captivity is the most endangered of the gorilla subspecies and is listed by the International Union for Conservation of Nature as critically endangered. This is the highest ranking for species that remain in the world and means that the population has decreased or will decrease by 80% within three generations. What you've seen here is uh, 
the worst form of deforestation, clear felling for agriculture, as you can just see. And oftentimes we've been saying that the greatest destroyer of the forest is actually agriculture, a system of farming. They are clearing this place to, to plant crops. And just imagine destroying the tropical high forest just to plant a few, a few, a few trees or like banana and, and what have you. So this banana and things like cocoa are substantially the greatest destroyer of our, of our, of our forest. So if we can come up with uh, strategies and policies to address that aspect of it, we we'll substantially save our rainforest. Definitely it's a, a great drawback. You know, it, it shrinks our carbon reserve, the forest that we often represent put out there, whether it's in the community forest, whether it's in the reserve area and what have you. It, it, it shrinks our, our, our carbon stock substantially. But we think that uh, we can still address uh, this problem by introducing eco-agriculture and where people will farm in environment-friendly manner. They don't have need to, to cut down the pristine forest. We have bush, we have other places like secondary forests. We can restrict our farming activities in that area. But we feel there's the need to engage the stakeholders, the communities, as far as this is concerned, so that they will adopt new farming practices, farming practices that are environment friendly. This subspecies of gorilla was unknown to science until the early 20th century. Only found in a few forest patches in Nigeria and Cameroon, this western gorilla subspecies is the world's rarest great ape. It is a subspecies of the western gorilla. It differs from other subspecies, the western lowland gorilla, in skull and tooth dimensions. And it is usually found in mountain rainforest between 1,500 and 3,500 meters and in bamboo forest from about 2,500 to 3,000 meters. Many cross river gorilla groups live in unprotected forests and face the threat of habitat loss through logging and as local people clear land for agriculture and cattle grazing. One of the main challenges, I guess, is that the, the populations surrounding these remaining animals are, are poor. They have few alternative options for making livelihoods, so they're hunters, they're farmers, um, and it's difficult to persuade people like that to give up hunting, to persuade them not to cut down forests because chimpanzees are living there when they need to be providing a livelihood so that's obviously a main challenge another challenge then is um, we have some excellent protected areas in Cross River State we have Cross River National Park but unfortunately it's not um, well funded it's not particularly well managed it's got some problems of hunting and logging we also have a number of forest reserves in the state managed by the Cross River State Forestry Commission and again, some of these have been lost to, to agriculture, some have been converted to plantations, and so very few of those are still viable. As far as that open up by timber companies, hunters move in. The subspecies also faces the risk of inbreeding and loss of genetic diversity due to the small population size and the low flow of genetic exchange between the different subpopulations. Although areas of unoccupied potential gorilla habitat still remain and can provide connectivity between the subpopulations, these areas are not yet safe for gorillas to use. The good thing is that I think very few species have actually gone extinct in, in Cross River State. So we still have, the, we still have animals like the gorilla and, and chimpanzee and drill and elephant and, and leopard. They're still here in the state. Um, but if you go, if you trek up to, take a, you know, a vehicle up to Boki, um, areas in northern Cross River State, like the Afi Mountain Wildlife Sanctuary, yes, there are animals there, but your chances of seeing them are small. Um, you're more likely to perhaps see a squirrel or some birds or butterflies, animals like that. But if you go there thinking you will see gorillas, I think it's, it's quite unlikely. The continued fragmentation of Cross River Gorilla habitat across a large complex area together with the threats from hunting and the small number of gorillas remaining has led to its critically endangered status. The Cross River Gorilla is one of the 25 most endangered primates worldwide, that is according to the IUCN. 
the main thing to do is to improve levels of protection. It's the only thing. We can't go to a, another country and buy some animals and come and release them. So that the only thing really we can do is manage our existing forests better. That means more ranges, more forest guards, better training, better equipment, vehicles, allowances. But it also means better supervision. So just sending forest guards out to the forest is not enough if we're going to sit in Calabar or Camper or Ecom and not supervise that work. So we've got to make sure that the people we're sending out of the forest are actually working to protect those animals in the forest that we're paying them to do. Many NGOs were involved in helping the state government revise the, the forestry and wildlife law. It's now a, a combined forestry and wildlife law. And, and I believe, we're not yet seeing the, the actual document, is that the penalties for, for hunting and, and illegal fishing, illegal farming were, were increased. So I think that will, will help a lot because the legislation has always been in place. One of the problems was that the penalties were outdated. So you know, for killing an elephant or something, it might have only been 10 naira. So obviously you need a much more tough penalty for, for people, but you also need better law enforcement as well. Um, you can have the best legislation in the world, but if you're not going out into the forest and with the arrangers and people actually making the arrest, then that will not happen. At the federal level as well, yes, some of the, that legislation is outdated. There's an endangered species decree which is now more than 20 years old, and there are penalties within that which are, are seriously outdated. We know the rates of inflation in the country, so the legislation and the penalties have to keep pace with that. And there has been some moves by the, the Federal Ministry of Environment to, to update that, that decree, and you know, that should be given more emphasis and it should be passed into law as Cross River State Government were able to do. So I think you know, a lot of people understand the laws. It's, the problem is often lack of alternatives, lack of other options. Um, a lot of the work that WCS has been doing is with education. So working in villages and in schools surrounding some of these key national parks or forest reserves or wildlife sanctuaries, working with children in schools to set up conservation clubs just to generate some local pride and awareness and responsibility for local wildlife, wildlife that actually belongs to local people. Um, we also have had a, a radio program to try and generate awareness and, and, and improve levels of understanding. But we've also tried targeting specific hunters in the village. Normally if you go to a village, it's not everybody that's hunting. There's usually one or two guys that are specialised, that are unwilling to, to give up you know, what they've been doing for years. So we've tried targeting those individual hunters, talking to them and giving them some training. The Cross River Gorilla is a unique subspecies that only lives in a relatively small area. With only a few hundred individuals remaining, it is in very real danger of becoming extinct unless it is properly cared for. That's it from me, Ayola Kasim. Thank you for your company. I'll be back with you next week, God willing. But before then, do you have any comment or question? You can send them to us by writing to sfile at channelstv.com. <laughs>